World War II Expeditionary Logistics and Support in the Pacific. Hi, my name is Salmer Cogliano. I'm the host of What's Going On with Shipping, but I'm also an Associate Professor of History at Campbell University and a Maritime Historian. And at times I am asked to present and write papers on historical issues related to my research. My research tends to focus on the interaction between commercial shipping and national defense. Back in February of 2022, I was asked to present to the National uh, Naval Expeditionary Warfare Conference on this subject, the interaction and use of commercial and military shipping in forms of logistics early in the Pacific War. So I thought this would be a great topic to look at and delve into and discuss the major issues associated with it. If you're new to the channel, please take a moment, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. Again, this channel focuses on global shipping, transportation, supply chain, but we also always like to delve back in and look at the history of events. So this topic is one that I find of particular interest because if you look at naval logistics in World War II, the focus tends to be on late World War II. However, early in the war is probably the best analogy I can find for if we were to wage a peer-to-peer -peer conflict today across the Pacific with a country like China, for example, we would be in a very similar position. Late in World War II, if you look at the amount of vessels that were involved, the U.S. service forces, the ships that were devoted to logistics, literally made up a sixth of the Navy. Over 455,000 sailors, 2,930 ships were involved in it. But early in the war, 1940, for example, before the U.S. even enters in World War II, we had 344 warships, of which 120 were auxiliaries, a very similar kind of number to where we stand today in terms of number of warships and the auxiliaries. And in this study in particular, I focus on two elements from literally the start of World War II till about early 1943, and that is on fuel and repair. There's a lot of other elements, obviously, you can look at, but my focus was on those two areas. So the big focus early in World War II is that of the fast carrier task forces. Books by like Ian Toll's Pacific Crucible, James Hornfisher's Neptune's Inferno, and John Tolan's But Not in Shame really focus on those. And ships like Enterprise, Yorktown, Saratoga, Lexington, Wasp, and Hornet are the focuses that tend to really occupy most of a narrative in these histories. However, one of the things that's really important to talk about here is a misconception regarding U.S. naval power in the Pacific. One of the things that's usually believed is, well, Pearl Harbor destroyed the American fleet, and therefore there was no battleships left. And that's a misconception. While five out of the eight battleships at Pearl Harbor were sunk or heavily damaged, three of them were put back into service fairly quickly. There was another on the West Coast and three others that transferred almost immediately through the Panama Canal to California, meaning that within a short period of time, seven battleships were in place to form the core of Task Force One. They would be supplemented by two fast battleships within the next few months, North Carolina and Washington. However, even with the reconstitution of the battle force, the U.S. had to face a very difficult decision because of the lack of fuel resources and fuel stockpiles in Pearl Harbor and throughout the Pacific, and the lack of tankers, specifically oilers. These are Navy vessels that can provide underway replenishment, fuel vessels while at sea. The U.S. had to make a tough decision. Do you basically focus on the battleships, which are very fuel-heavy vessels, or do you focus on the fast carriers, which are also fuel intensive? And the decision was to focus on the fast carriers. Now, while the carriers receive the bulk of the attention, in truth, I think the focus should be on the oilers. And in particularly a series of oilers that were designed and built in the years leading up to World War II. On December 7th, 1941, the U.S. had 28 oilers and tankers. 
Most of them were in the Atlantic, 15 of them. Two were in the Asiatic fleet and 11 assigned to the Pacific fleet. But the cream of that fleet, really the focus that was being done, were the 12 T3 Cimarron-class fast oilers. These ships have been built under not a Navy program, but a commercial program, built for commercial companies under the Merchant Marine Act of 1936. However, they included national defense features. For example, instead of being single screw, one propeller, they were twin screwed. Much bigger engines, giving them higher speed, accommodations for additional crew, provisions for radios and anti-aircraft guns, and also fittings so that they could provide underway replenishment. And six of these, the Cimarron, the Neosho, featured there at Pearl Harbor, backing away from Battleship Row between uh, the California and the West Virginia, uh, Platt, Sabine, Kaskaskia, and Guadalupe, in many ways, are as important, if not more important, than the six carriers of the fast carrier fleet. I think they're very complementary, in my opinion. These ships, capable of 18 knots, carrying nearly 150,000 barrels of oil, were absolutely the linchpin for this. Previous Navy oilers were much smaller. They were limited to 10.5 to 14 knots and could only carry literally a third to a half of that capability, about 55 to 75,000 barrels. And throughout World War II, the fast oilers were the essential element attached to nearly every carrier fast task force that was sent out. As I mentioned to you before, six of them will be operating in the Pacific, two in the Atlantic, and then four of them are taken in hand very early for conversion into escort carriers. And unlike the way we think of escort carriers later in World War II, these four, the, the what's called the Sagamon class, were actually interim relief fleet carriers. Those ships of the Essex and Independence class could come in. Uh, it was estimated that a fast carrier task force at sea would consume nearly 6,000 barrels of fuel daily, more so if they were in combat operations and had to steam above normal cruising speed. That means a fast oiler by itself could provide enough fuel for a fast carrier task force for approximately three to four weeks, depending on the scope and scale of that operation. And so fast carrier oilers were extremely important to the operation of the Pacific Fleet, particularly early in World War II. The Pacific focus tends to be this drive across. If you study uh, World War II in the Pacific, you get the Central Pacific Drive, you get the, the South Pacific Drive, what eventually becomes the Southwest Pacific Drive under Admirals Halsey and then combined with MacArthur. But early in World War II, the story here was lines of communication, particularly from Hawaii, the West Coast, and Panama to Australia. And those lines of communication were absolutely essential. You know, how does one support and sustain a trans-Pacific sea line of communication to support an allied nation like Australia? As the Japanese were driving into southeastern Asia, into the area of the Dutch East Indies, modern-day Indonesia today, there was really no way to supply Australia from the Indian Ocean. And the U.S., assumed the burden to really sustain Australia, and not just Australia militarily, but also civilian. And that meant a couple of key things. At the Arcadia Conference in December of 1941, the U.S. decided their Pacific strategy would resolve around a couple of key issues. Number one, they would establish a defense area around Hawaii, Midway, Johnson, and Palmyra Island, really the base for the Central Pacific. Second, they would establish secure lines of communication to Australia. Now, that's easier said than done. From Panama to Sydney, Australia is 7,500 miles. From San Francisco to Sydney is 7,200 miles. And then to Pearl Harbor to Sydney, because of the roundabout way they had to go, not traveling through Japanese territory, it was nearly 5,000 miles. And Early before U.S. entry into World War I, the U.S. had started a base development program where bases on islands such as Wake and Midway were being developed. Matter of fact, one of the reasons the 
Pacific Fleet aircraft carriers are not in Pearl Harbor that day is because the Enterprise is returning from Wake Island from delivering a Marine fighter squadron, and Lexington was en route to Midway to d- deliver a dive bombing squadron. And the U.S. had started to dispatch Marine defense battalions to some of these islands to hold them. But the other part here out of Arcadia was this plan to establish this basically chain of bases between Hawaii, the West Coast, and Panama to Australia. And to establish that, they needed to establish these kind of uh, really important bases that were going to be the key kind of starting point. Some bases had already been established down in Samoa was a uh, major naval anchorage with airfields. There were several other airfields established at Johnson Island, Palmyra, and Canton, and obviously up at Midway and Wake. But phase one of this building plan required the establishment of several key bases. One of the first one was labeled Bobcat, and this was at Bora Bora in the Society Islands. Now, Bobcat and Bora Bora do not get any sort of attention in most studies of World War II in the Pacific. But I would argue this is one of the key staging bases early in the war. If you look at early early part of World War II, particularly the Japanese narrative, they are advancing across the Pacific, grabbing islands and advancing. In many ways, the U.S. is doing the same thing. Many of these islands, while they may be owned by the British, the Americans, uh, the Australians, or whoever— really don't have any defense on them. So it's whoever gets there first gets to fortify them. In the case of Bobcat, it's established as a fueling depot. Because of the great distance, the 7,500 miles, for example, from Panama to Sydney, you need a refueling depot because most ships can't steam that distance. And even if they can steam that distance to Australia, there's not enough fuel to get the vessels back from Australia. You really don't want the vessels consuming fuel in Australia. It's going to be needed there. So the very first establishment of a base is there. Six ships sail from Charleston, South Carolina, a mix of Navy and Army ships and commercial vessels. And an older Navy oiler is sent there to act as a station tanker until shoreside facilities can be erected. And Bobcat is a disaster. It takes them weeks to offload. The cargo is loaded on the ships in an improper way. The gear they need to offload the vessel is at the bottom of the ship, not at the top. And it just turns into a long, laborious project. But immense lessons are learned from this, not the least of which Navy Construction Battalion, Seabees, learn a lot about what needs to be done about advanced base development. The other base set up is down in Nomia at a place called Poppy. And there's a vital idea that we have to set up this base to protect that sea line of communication that passes just to the south of the island so that the Japanese who are starting to make inroads down the uh, uh, Bismarck Archipelago, the Su- Solomon Islands, can be halted. And so a Army task force is sent there. What eventually becomes the Americal Division will be sent there to basically hold that area as we develop. Other issues that go on is the reinforcement of Hawaii and some of the outer islands. This takes advantage of U.S commercial vessels, ships from the American President's line, from Matson, are used, and they're able to be convoyed across by the U.S. Navy. The U.S. has to, because of early Japanese submarine attacks along the West Coast and around the Hawaiian Islands, have to escort these convoys across the Pacific. That means delegating a heavy cruiser, a light cruiser, and several destroyers to it. And so that initial shipments are done. Phase two of the plan involves further development. At Samoa, straw is developed. An entire Marine brigade is going to be escorted there. The carrier Yorktown, when it comes through the canal with the oiler Guadalupe, is going to carry an entire Marine brigade to go into Samoa. Uh, Bleacher is established at Tonga as a naval base. Again, another key staging point. And then Roses in the island of Efate are established with Army and Marine Corps defense battalions put in place. And then the last part of Phase 3, which happens about mid-1942, is we start seeing the development of a forward airfield at Espiritu Santo as the Japanese begin their movement down the Solomons to counter that. At Fantan, uh, the 37th Infantry Division moves into the Fiji Islands to relieve New Zealand forces so that they could be withdrawn and organized so that they could be used offensively 
in the future. And at the same time, two entire army divisions of the 32nd and the 41st are shipped from the United States to Australia to develop into these key bases. Now, as that's going on, one of the things that we see here are early carrier raids. And I would argue that a lot of those early carrier raids, which we see, for example, we, we see the, uh, the Enterprise in the Yorktown hitting the Gilbert Islands and the Marshall Islands. A lot of the, and we see the Lexington going against uh, uh, Rabaul. We see the Lexington in the Yorktown going against Ley. A lot of these earlier carrier raids, I think, are mis judged. They're usually taken as kind of, you know, let's hit the Japanese, let's give them a little bit of a hit, and let's get some experience for those carrier groups. When in truth, I would argue that many of these raids are trying to hit Japanese logistics bases and slow down their advances. So for example, when the Enterprise hits the Marshall Islands in February of 42, in an effort to cover the deployment of the Marine Brigade to Samoa, along with the Yorktown, they're going after those submarine bases that have been really attacking shipping around the Hawaiian Islands and the West Coast of the United States. When Yorktown and Lexington hit Ley in the northern coast of uh, New Guinea, it's an effort to slow down the Japanese assault heading toward eventually Port Moresby that, event, that results in the battle at Yorktown. And understand the Japanese have a plan. The plan is in January, they hit Rabaul. In March of 42, they hit the uh, uh, the island of, uh, excuse me, the, the port of Ley in northern New Guinea. And then uh, in May, they're going to hit Port Moresby on the southern coast of New Guinea. In June, they take the Aleutians and Midway Island. And then in July, their plan is to take Fiji, Samoa, and New Caledonia. So their plan is to hit uh, the bases at Straw, Fantan, and Poppy, and really put themselves abreast of that supply line and sever that connection between the Australians and the U.S. And again, I, I think we don't focus enough on these early six months of World War II to understand what this logistics fight is turning up to be. Now, the key battle is in May of 1942 at the Battle of Coral Sea. We tend to think of Midway as, of course, the important battle in June of 42, which it is. But in many ways, the Coral Sea attack is a really important one for a variety of reasons. We usually acknowledge it as the first major fight between carrier forces at sea. However, the other element that's here is, is understand, is this the first time really we've seen prolonged carrier, fast hat carrier task forces deployed away from their main base at Hawaii? And in this case, Task Force 11 and 17, 11 is the Lexington, 17 is the Yorktown, are dispatched down there to stem that Japanese offensive against Port Moresby. Task Forces 16 and 18, the Enterprise and the Hornet, are en route there after launching the Doolittle Raid, but they got to come by this very, you know, kind of long route around the Japanese holdings. But the operation in the Coral Sea really stretched the ability of the Pacific Fleet under Admiral Nimitz to support it. His requirements based on operations of not just those two task forces, Lexington and Yorktown, but also Enterprise and Hornet, told him he's going to need five fast oilers, five of the six fast oilers he's going to need down there. He's going to need three older oilers and three commercial tankers arriving every month to keep up this level of sustainment. And obviously, these carriers are going to burn through their fuel. And as they do burn their, through their fuel, ships are going to have to return either to the main depot at Honolulu at Pearl Harbor to get fuel or actually sail all the way to the West Coast. One of the reasons they're using these fast oilers is so that they can sail all the way back and get it. And one of the things that became very clear is, is how fast these carriers were burning through their fuel. Uh, it was estimated that those four task forces would require 370,000 barrels of fuel per month. And to establish a safe number, about 450,000 tons per month, he needed those eight oilers and those three commercial tankers to provide that. And that was a heavy burden 
on the few logistic ships he had. Back in January of 1942, the War Shipping Administration, or excuse me, the, uh, the U.S. government, eventually through the War Shipping Administration, would make available to Admiral Nimitz 22 tankers, 20 large tankers and two smaller ones. Those tankers would be responsible from shuttling from the West Coast and from the Gulf Coast through the Panama Canal, fuel to the depots in Pearl Harbor and throughout the Pacific. But he found out very quickly that that was woefully inefficient, requested more tankers to be allotted, but unfortunately could not get them because of the German U-boat offensive along the East Coast of the United States in the first six months of the war. Uh, the loss of Lexington in the Coral Sea negated part of the requirements for fuel down in the Pacific, but that was offset by the loss of Neosho, one of those six fast tankers. By this point, the uh, Pacific Fleet had lost now three tankers, the Neches, the uh, Pecos, and now the Neosho. Fast forward a few months to Guadalcanal, August 1942. The U.S. wins the Battle of Midway. The Pacific Fleet is able to defeat them. Three oilers are supporting that operation in Midway. But now Guadalcanal is going to be held. The decision to grab Cactus, the very southern, uh, one of the most southern islands in the Solomon chain, Guadalcanal, will be seized along with Tulagi. Three carriers, a battleship, 14 cruisers, 60-plus destroyers, 20 amphibs, all to be dispatched to this area. And again, they have to do that figuring. How many tankers, how much is it going to take to do this? Uh, it was acknowledged that three fast oilers would have to sail with the task force, bringing with them about 450,000 barrels of fuel. Two fast oilers would be on the West Coast to bring 300,000 barrels of fuel every month. And you would rotate out the fast tankers rolling back. And then two additional commercial tankers bringing in about 225,000 barrels of fuel would be needed. And it was estimated by Admiral Gormley he'd be using 28,000 barrels of fuel a day or 850,000 a month. One of the things we, we, he, we criticize Admiral Fletcher about, for example, during the withdrawal from Guadalcanal after the Battle of Savo Island, is concern about fuel. Fuel was a primary concern. Matter of fact, we see one carrier miss combat in the Pacific because of this. The Wasp has to sail all the way back to port. She misses the Battle of Eastern Solomons later in August for that reason. And eventually, uh, the Pacific Fleet requests not only for more commercial ships to come, but they request that the commercial tankers that are dispatched starting in September to be outfitted with the ability to provide underway replenishment. And fuel becomes the ultimate driver for the Pacific War. Later in the war, we'll see massive underway replenishment groups, multiple oilers supported by fleets of War Shipping Administration tankers coming across the Pacific, setting up in anchorages in atolls across the Pacific so that they can provide the necessary fuel. But early in the war, it is a shoestring operation for the United States to provide the underway replenishment of fuel necessary to keep the fast carriers afloat. In many ways, it's the attrition of the American fast carriers that allows them to maintain their fleet forward. It's losing Lexington at Coral Sea. It's losing Yorktown at Midway. It's losing Wasp and then Hornet in uh, the area around Guadalcanal. It's the damaging of Saratoga. It's the damaging of Enterprise that allows, for example, the deployment of fast battleships to the region because they can sustain battleships like the Washington, the North Carolina, the South Dakota, and all because the U.S. has a very finite amount of tankers and oilers that are available. The other subject I like to talk about is that of repair. And the repair issue is one of the critical things that allows the United States to succeed in World War II. The U.S. had set up a repair facility on the island of Tonga. Uh, they dispatched repair vessels out to that region the start of the Guadalcanal campaign. The destroyer tender Whitney, the hospital ship Solace, uh, 
the uh, underway replenishment, the stored vessels, the Aldebaran, the Talamar, and then the ammunition vessel Rainier were all set out there, and Tonga was established as a base. And the lack of forward repair facilities would become a major problem early in the Guadalcanal campaign. As ships were damaged, they had to sail back to Tonga. So, for example, when the Enterprise was hit at the Battle of Eastern Solomon, she had to sail back to Tonga to be repaired. And eventually the decision was made to create what was called this uh, series of base repairs, uh, depending on size and scale, what were known as the Lions and the Cubs, these fleet advance bases. And the decision is, is decided to shift them, not from Auckland in New Zealand, but up to Espiritu Santo in the region just south of Guadalcanal. And one of the things we see here is this is a list of all the major combatant vessels larger than a light cruiser that was used by the United States and the Royal Australian Navy in the Pacific, basically in the latter half of 1942. Task Force 8 was a, ta a task force up in the Aleutian Islands, but all the other ones, 11, 16, 17, 18, those were the fast carrier task forces. Task Force 62 was the task force that was used to support the amphibious invasion of Guadalcanal. And then reinforcements were set in. And when you look at the attrition of the battle, you'll see the ships in blue there are ships that were damaged. Ships in red are the ones that are sunk. Nearly every major combatant involved in the Guadalcanal campaign was either damaged or sunk. Very few came away without a scratch. And what's interesting here is you can see where the vessels had to go to eventually get repaired. And if you look at, for example, at the St. Louis, the Honolulu, the Nashville, who were damaged later uh, post uh, very toward the end of the Guadalcanal campaign, the, the Southern Solomon campaign, St. Louis had to go to Mare Island in California. Honolulu had to go to Pearl Harbor and then Mare Island. And then Nashville went to Mare Island. And many of these ships had to go to repair facilities close by or off to repair facilities all the way on the East Coast. So, for example, the Boise, uh, which was damaged at the Battle of Cape Esperance, had to go to Philadelphia. The South Dakota went to the Brooklyn Navy Yard in New York. And even the vessels that were sunk, those in red, were eventually replaced by new builds at shipyards and ship facilities that were building them. A new Wasp is built at Newport News. A new Hornet is built at Newport News. A new Atlanta is built at New York Shipbuilding. A new Quincy at Bethlehem uh, Quincy Yard. And understand, early in the the Guadalcanal campaign, when you had the Battle of Sabo Island in August of 1942, four American and Australian heavy cruisers are heavily damaged. Two are sunk almost immediately, but two of them, which potentially could have been saved, have to be scuttled and sunk because there's not enough repair facilities or secure repair facilities close by to save them. And this lack of repair facilities leads to the loss of Canberra, Vincennes, Quincy, and Astoria. Chicago will be sunk later. She's damaged at Sabo Island, but sunk later at Reynolds Island. The lack of, first off, close repair facilities, enough to get the vessel out of the field of damage, field of battle to a primary or secondary repair facility and then off to a primary repair, repair facility is absolutely essential. Since there was nothing around Guadalcanal and Tulagi at the Battle of Sabo Island, ships had to be lost. Now, later in the war, repair facilities would be established around Guadalcanal and Tulagi. Repair facilities at Sydney, Australia, at Espiritu Santo would be set up to enact enough repair so that vessels could sail back to either Hawaii or the United States for further repair. One of the best examples of that is the story of the USS Minneapolis, CA-36, the Battle of Tassafaranga in late 1942, November. She was hit by two Japanese Type 93 torpedoes, what are commonly referred to as long lance torpedoes. She took one in the engine compartment and one detonated just forward of her uh, number one turret, where she lost most of her bow section. Two other heavy cruisers were damaged in that battle and one was sunk. Very similar to what happened at the Battle of Sabo Island with four heavy cruisers being sunk. 
But in the case of Tassiferanga, only one of those heavy cruisers, the Northampton, is lost. The other three, the Minneapolis pictured here, the New Orleans, and the Pensacola, are all salvaged and returned to the fight. In the case of Minneapolis, her bow had to be literally severed off, had to be cut off. Uh, she pulled into the island of Tulagi across from Guadalcanal using the ship's force along with some CBs and some repair facilities that were in place there. They removed the bow. They cut it completely off. They shored up the bow with with coconut uh, trees, basically cut wood so that they can basically cover her up. And that allowed her to sail to Espiritu Santo across the Coral Sea. There, a temporary bow was installed on her, and then the vessel could sail to the Pearl Harbor Navy shipyard for the installation of a new bow. Ship lost its bow in November of 42. It is back in service by April of 43. And nearly all the ships in the campaign were replaced by new builds or repaired and were back in service before the end of the war. What conclusion can we draw from this historical lesson? And I actually think there's many of them that we can draw upon. One of the things we see here is how this long protracted supply line from the United States, Hawaii and California to Australia could be similar to a long protracted supply line across the Pacific to the first island chain in a potential war with China. Anyways, we operate in the same way as we did in the Pacific early in World War II, these single carrier task forces, either carriers or amphibious groups. Uh, we lack resupply bases. Uh, we lack really the number of resupply bases. This is actually magnified with the loss of the Red Hill fueling facility at Pearl Harbor, the decision to drain that facility and not have a major fuel depot in Hawaii is going to be catastrophic. Now, there are, there are other facilities in Hawaii, Barbers Point and a few others, but the loss of Red Hill will be significant. Most of our conflicts that we have fought have been very short distance from our supply chain. This, this chart illustrates that. In, in the Persian Gulf, for example, Desert Shield, Desert Storm, we were 400 miles from our supply base. That's less than a day travel. In Korea, we, we supplied the forces in Korea from Japan. In Vietnam, we did it from Subic Bay in the Philippines. In the Persian Gulf, we did it from Bahrain and, and, and uh, Oman and regions like that. But a potential war in the Pacific may have to come from Guam, which is nearly six days away, from Hawaii, which is over 17 days away, or from the West Coast, which is nearly 24 days away. And this lack of resupply bases is critical. There's a lack of a merchant marine and a building program from which to draw upon commercial tankers. You know, you know, as in the start of the Guadalcanal campaign, we may need to run fast oilers back to the West Coast. We have fast oilers. We have the Kaiser class oilers. We have the brand new John Lewis class oilers, very similar to what you saw with the Cimarron class oilers. But what we don't have are commercial tankers to provide that linchpin between the fuel bases and the underway replenishment vessels. So we may have to be sending our few underway replenishment vessels all the way back to the West Coast. Uh, raises the question about the retirement of the Kaiser class oilers. A recent announcement by the U.S. Navy to retire 24 vessels in that group are two Kaiser class oilers. Are we going to lose them? Should we put them into a reserve status, for example? Uh, do we need a program to ensure that Jones Act tankers, those tankers that work in the U.S. coastal trade, are available uh, to the military with the potential to be outfitted with modular fuel deployment systems. In September, October of 42, Admiral Nimitz was requesting that any tanker coming out to the Pacific be able to do underway replenishment. Should we be fitting that on commercial tankers today, providing them with some money to offset that cost? And then the transport of forces, we used Matson, American President's lines, and other shipping lines to immediately ship out troops, supplies, and equipment. Are they available? Today, APL has only six ships in its Trans-Pacific route that we can use. There's really no other American ships except for Matson, uh, which provides Hawaii, uh, to do it. And APL and Matson today are a shell of what they were, especially compared to foreign lines out there. And as the Ch Chinese expand into the Central Pacific and South Pacific, 
Are they going to be athwart our supply lines? Is that a potential cutting, much like we saw that fight to defend that supply line from the U.S. to Australia? Can the Chinese be abreast of our supply line today? The lack of a float or mobile repair facilities means that ships damaged may not be able to return to the U.S., you know, during World War II, while the U.S. replaced and repaired all capital ships committed to the campaign at Guadalcanal, that may not be the case in the future. The Japanese, for example, were never able to do this and fought a war of attrition while their enemy used shipyards that were geared to naval and commercial construction to restore their fleet and add more. Today, China builds 40% of the world's commercial ships. In the same yard that's building the newest Chinese warships, they're building commercial vessels. China would be able to take vessels damaged, bring them back to their country and repair them. The U.S. would be hard pressed to do that because of the lack of repair facilities. It took over two and a half years to repair McCain and Fitzgerald after their collisions in 2017. The U.S. shifted their mobile repair facilities to follow the fleet while permanent entities like Lion and Cub bases were created ashore to, to provide a depth of repair and service. Do we have that ability to load and fly out or ship out repair facilities so that we can do it in theater? We don't have the tenders anymore that we once had. We lack the logistics and repair infrastructure. And it really goes back to this issue that I think is, is really the most critical when you look at it, look at this situation, you know, today the U.S. Navy is the number one Navy in the world. I think it's, it's fairly well acknowledged that, although China is close behind right now. But the U.S. Navy may be number one, but the U.S. Merchant Marine is number 21. China's Navy is number two, if not number one, but their Merchant Marine is number two. And it raises the question, who's the better proponent of sea power? Is it the United States or is it China. And in many ways, you can make that argument about the U.S. and Japan in early parts of World War II. Who was better prepared to fight that war? The U.S. We had the Navy. We had the infrastructure. We were rebuilding. We had a large commercial fleet, a large shipyard capacity, and we were building ships prior to the war that were going to come out and be a substantial game changer when the war was fought. Japan never is able really to replace the ships they lose, and the ships that are damaged take a long time to get repaired and back out to service, largely because not that the Japanese shipyards were not good, they were, but they lacked resources, they lacked capabilities. And in many ways, are we the Japan in a future Pacific War scenario, and is China the United States? That's the logistics question I posed with my paper. So I hope you enjoyed this paper. If you did, I'd love to re read comments about it. Go ahead and throw them in there. If you like this channel, if you like some history thrown in with some current subject matter on global shipping and naval matters, then please subscribe. Hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos. As they come out, be sure to leave a comment. Give it a thumbs up. Please leave a comment. I'm really interested in perspectives on this. Love starting a dialogue on my videos. Uh, if you can... Support the channel through Patreon. That allows us to put videos like this out and to develop more and more programming. So until the next video, this is Sal, signing off.